So we are going to do the integral from 0 to 1 of natural log x dx. Now once we've gone through our first few years of calculus, this is a pretty easy integral to evaluate. So we're going to have a little fun with it and say, instead of using u substitution, instead of using integration by parts, we're going to restrict ourselves and say we have to use Feynman's technique in order to evaluate this integral. Now Feynman's technique, which is also known as the Leibniz rule, says if we define some function i of t as an integral, in this case from 0 to 1, of some function of t and x, so let's say we have natural log of t times x with respect to x, if we differentiate with respect to t, what we get is the integral from 0 to 1 again, but we take the partial derivative of whatever is on the inside with respect to t. And this usually allows us to turn our complicated function, like a natural log, into something easier. In this case, the partial derivative with respect to t, remember a partial derivative just means that we pretend anything that's not t is a constant. So in this case, we say x is a constant, and we differentiate with respect to t. Well, the derivative of natural log of tx is going to be 1 over tx, and then by the chain rule, the derivative of tx, well, x is a constant. So when we differentiate this, we actually get x on the top. Notice x is on the top and bottom, so we can cancel those out, and we just end up with 1 over t dx. Well, in this case, we're integrating with respect to x. 1 over t is just a constant. So we'll end up with 1 over t times x evaluated at 1 and 0, which will give us the final result of 1 over t. So that means that our i prime of t is equal to 1 over t. And now we can integrate both sides. If we integrate i prime of t dt and then integrate 1 over t dt, then we'll get the answer of i of t equals, well, the integral of 1 over t is just natural log absolute value of t plus c. This plus c is going to give us a little trouble because in order to use Feynman's trick for integration, we have to know at least one value of this integral. Because if we know one value of the integral, we can plug it in. For example, if we knew that i of 1 was equal to negative 1, well, then we could plug in 1 everywhere and then say i of 1 equals natural log absolute value of 1 plus c. And then we could solve for c because we can plug in i of 1 equals negative 1. But in this case, we have i of t equals natural log t plus c but we don't know any values for this integral because that's the whole thing we're trying to figure out. Normally, when we want to use the natural log of tx, we like to have a plus 1 on the end of the natural log because when we do this, we can say i of 0. Well, the i of 0 will be the natural log of 0 plus 1, and the natural log of 1 is, of course, 0. So we get that as our answer. And this gives us a known value we can plug in. Here we don't have a plus 1, so we have to think about some other strategy to figure out how we can turn this into an i of t that we can get information about. Initially, you might think, well, if we just need a plus 1 inside of this integral to make it work, maybe we do a substitution and just let x equal u plus 1, then dx equals du, and we can write this integral as the integral from, in this case, negative 1 to 0, plugging in the bounds, of natural log u plus 1 du. And then we can do this one with Feynman's trick. The problem here is this integral actually becomes very, very ugly when we try to use Feynman's technique on it in this form. So this is actually not going to help us. It's just going to make the integral more complicated. We're going to need some other method we're actually going to need to think outside of the box. So here's the method that I came up with. Normally when we do Feynman's trick, we start with some function i of t that we want to integrate, and then we differentiate it to get something that's easy to deal with. But maybe we want to do that in reverse. We start with a function that's easy to deal with, and then differentiate it to get something that we want. So let's think about that. If we want our i prime of t to be the function that we want. Well, what function, when you differentiate it, gives you natural log of x? Remember, we're differentiating with respect to t, so x is like a constant. 
if we think about the derivative with respect to t of something equals something times natural log x. If this is a partial derivative, what derivative has a natural log in the answer? And the solution is x to the t. If we differentiate x to the t with respect to t, we get x to the t times natural log x. And this, as long as we plug in t equals 0, is the integral that we want. So let's apply that strategy. Instead of starting with this natural log, we do the other strategy. We let i of t equal the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the t dx. And this is an integral that we know how to do. We can just use the power rule. t is a constant with respect to x. So if we apply the power rule, this equals x to the t plus 1 over t plus 1, evaluated at 1 and 0. Well, 0 to the t plus 1 is just 0. And if we evaluate it at the upper bound, we'll just get 1 to the t plus 1, which is just 1, divided by t plus 1. So i of t equals 1 over t plus 1. On the other hand, if we differentiate i with respect to t, if we do i prime of t, what we get is the derivative with respect to t of x to the t. Well, that's going to give us x to the t times natural log x. So i prime of t is this integral. Our goal is to find i prime of 0, because i prime of 0 is the integral of natural log x, since x to the 0 is just 1. But we know i of t equals 1 over t plus 1. So what is i prime of t? Well, i prime of t is just going to be the derivative of 1 over t plus 1, which we can easily find. That's negative 1 over t plus 1 squared. So if we want i prime of 0, we just plug in 0. i prime of 0 equals negative 1 over 0 plus 1 squared. Of course, 0 plus 1 is 1. Negative 1 over 1 squared is negative 1. That is the answer to our integral. The integral from 0 to 1 of natural log x dx equals negative 1. So when we want to think about using things like Feynman's technique and other advanced things, sometimes we have to think outside of the box a little bit. If we understand the structure of how the method is applied, sometimes we can do it in unorthodox ways that weren't how we were taught in class, but that give us the answers that we need just like this.